Hi, I'm going to share with you my experience uh, in Washington, D.C. I spent a whole week visiting the Washington Monument, the Supreme Court, United States Capitol, an internal tour inside the White House, Lincoln Memorial, and so much more. I learned from a set of speakers who came, and uh, it was all from the people working in the government. The very first person who came was Chris. He is the guy who's loved by both the Democrats and the Republicans. And he shared with us a really important power to convene, how you can bring people together. As leaders, we have that power. We can set up a meeting at any time. We can bring people together. And how do we catalyze collective action? He's actually shown that he can do it. And even in politics, we can all do it. So power to convene was an important lesson from him. He shared this book, The Sum of Us, and that's uh, an inspiration and recently released. He shared that learning also how to translate, not just translating a language, which is also translation, but like if you can translate how politicians speak, if you can speak their language, you can translate and understand how to get your work done. If you can translate a culture outside of America, if you can translate Chinese culture, let's say, on how they work. And building that translation capability was a key learning from him as well. And he shared about his life experience growing up and how he naturally learned some of these skills that he uses today extensively. And he also encouraged us to go and talk to the local representative and how surprised we would be to get stuff done by raising it to them. And he firmly, and he firmly believes in electing young people into politics. So it was a really good talk, great learning from him. Continuing on, Ambassador Don Steinberg, it's commendable how sharp he is in his memory and he at his age and he shared about the importance of USAID. I learned about USAID from him in the talk that he gave us and it was a Q&A session after and how I understood why is the US government giving money? They're giving money to advance US's national security and they're building foreign markets for the big companies in the US to actually export to. And they gave an example, stark example of South Korea. Back then, Kenya and South Korea, when the US started helping them in the 1960s, the USAID, look at where South Korea is today. So long-term, they're building markets, but they are doing it in such a way that they never have to invest in them again, meaning they are self-sustaining. So that was a striking example of South Korea for me. And another line was nothing about them without them, meaning give people the seat at the table. Don't disenfranchise people. If you are thinking about peace process, if you're thinking about a new rule, if you're thinking about a new technology, bring people together and listen to everyone. So don't do things on someone without their consent have them part of your committee. So nothing about them without them. Great line, isn't it? And he shared one really good future inspiration. He said in 2035, he wishes that the poverty is only available to see in the museums. And I was like, wow, that's a great one. And USAID, even though huge, $34 billion is less than 1%, less than 0.5% actually of the US budget. So Putting things in perspective was huge. Understanding this different aspect of USAID, great learning. Jonathan, current senior advisor on trade, supply chain with China and uh, China plus one. There's so much going on. He shared about the uh, importance of having a solid US supply chain, which not only can take care of short-term disruptions, medium-term, and long term is also sustainable. So he's talked about various insights about how to map out the bottlenecks, provide 
visibility on a supply chain as to where is your goods actually coming from for the companies that are actually importing. Government can do a lot to democratize the data and transparency as to where things are coming, what is the bottlenecks in supply chain. And they're working on this S1260 US Innovation and Competition Act of 2021 which will incentivize certain key industries that are critical, like semiconductors, electron, elect, electric vehicles, clean energy, pharma, food supply. And this data is actually very powerful because once you provide data, everyone can start using it to actually make a decision. Companies can use it to make better decisions. And in terms of leadership lessons, he shared something really important. He said, do your homework. Then you come to discussing something, when you are actually proposing something, be honest so that you have integrity in the work that you do. Be kind, communicate clearly. And even if you have to be tough at times, it's okay to be tough. So a lot of learning in terms of how the government is thinking in terms of improvising its supply chain, innovating in a big way with the US Innovation and Competition Act of 2021. The Chinese have invested in their local companies in a big way and us is thinking about doing that with this bill so great learning from jonathan as well this guy was pretty awesome jonathan mcbride look at this image on the right he said if you want to change the culture don't come come at the culture in a perpendicular way come in a parallel way integrate yourself learn the language and then eventually you know from the inside generate the demand from bottom up and actually then change the culture. So he's actually responsible for hiring hundreds of thousands of staff in the government, like the different types of people with different terms, confirmed people, four years, 48 months, semi-confirmed, 30 months, scheduled 18 months. What I learned from him mostly was in the government, people work at most for two years. And so when you have to work in such a short setting, you have to actually hire people quickly and you have to retain them if you don't want to hire more. So the way he says he retains people is moves. He moves people around in different teams where they get, they're on board, they're actually learning. And when they decide to leave, he knows their employees know that, hey, Jonathan would be open to moving him around or moving her around. And so really good insights from this uh, head of HR um, and also responsible for diversity, equity, and inclusion practices in the government. So very funny guy, very much in the moment, used humor. He gave clear, precise answers. Lots of learning from Jonathan. Ricardo, he shared some really interesting thing. He said, hey, in, in the public sector, in the government, there are no incentives. So meaning you can't like pay someone more if they do a better job. There are no targets. Meaning say, hey, save these many number of people versus save X, these many plus 10% of people. There are no real clear targets and there are no recourse. Meaning you can't like course correct uh, when things go really wrong because it's a huge process. So management in public sector is actually very difficult compared to the private sector. And he, in his example, was able to, as an implementation partner to the government, he partners um, with USAID and he shared examples on how he could scale up, do well at a large scale and do good. And so that was good learning from him. This guy whose photo is not here, but I, you know, we saw him, he's a really good guy, Masin Alfaik. I hope I have not um, pronounced it too wrong. I'm sure I did, but he shared about, uh, he's a current advisor at the US to the vice president of the United States, Kamala Harris. So he shared about, he's an ex, he's built expertise. He's, he's uh, built expertise after he joined around the Central America and the migration from Central America. And he shared really interesting things as to why people want to migrate to the United States by illegal means or even legal means. He said, in those developing countries, there is no proper healthcare with lots of corruption, there's bad education, low paying jobs, security of health, wealth, and even personal security is poor. And due to which there's human rights issues. 
freedom, lack of freedom, lack of uh, labor rights. So a lot of this, the root of all of this is economic prosperity. And so he is attacking that angle. The Trump government said, hey, we'll build a wall. But for them, they're doing much deeper to call, you know, find out the causes for this immigration, legal and illegal. And he also shared reasons why private sector is not investing. Let's say the US private sector wants to invest in, let's say, Mexico. The reason why they would not invest is because of a lot of corruption and security issues. Like if they invest a big plant and then a plant is taken, then that's a problem for them. So it makes it very hard. So the government can actually influence and work with the governments there to improve security, to improve and reduce corruption. So really good effort. They were challenged to by a question in the team that said, hey, how do you actually put your agenda clearly in front of the public so that people know what you're doing? And that's a difficult thing for them to do, and which I think is an important area that they need to also work on. Vivian, national security reporter, so, and uh, currently at Wall Street Journal, and shared really good insights around disinformation. How do you handle this information? So she says, triangulate. Look at multiple sources that are genuine, like established newspapers is a good one. So getting more sources of information and finding the counterfactuals will be the best way to find out and tackle this information. One really good question that was asked to her was around what is the innovation that she sees for journalism, because the journalism business model has not been disrupted for a while. And so she shared a really good example of what's up, upcoming with CNN. CNN Plus is a streaming version of to disrupt journalism, empowers the streamers to stream content. One really interesting I learned from her as a content creator is to create content in audio, video, photo, print, all formats because they're different audiences and then they'll, they'll want to see it in that different audiences would have a preference. So give them the content that they want to see. High energy, uh, he shared about various experiences she had in uh, working in the Middle East and uh, issues that she saw, how she became more comfortable and how she improved her skill. So really good learning from Vivian. And then finally we went to uh, Ambassador Esther Cooper Smith's house. So she was the ambassador to UNESCO for UN Secretary General. Mm -hmm. And she helped you know, President Biden to raise funds when Biden was not even known. So she's able to establish leaders. If you see this image here, it's, uh, it's a room in her home. And I took this photo and it's filled with photos that people gave her, like all the presidents. You can think about every president and they're all here in this photo. And in, 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 they've all given her a photo and then signed it. And she has like various uh, mementos and things. It's all decorated as a wall full of uh, memories on people that she's brought to her home here. And also people that she's helped. So she's able to identify future leaders and she genuinely goes and helps by connecting to people. And at her place, Democrats and Republicans, both of them, we've seen them come together and governments and government officials from countries that are you know, not at speaking terms, they come to her place and then they speak because she's able to bring them together. So power of convening was the best example by learning from uh, Ambassador Esther Cooper Smith. So huge huge uh, inspiration uh, around what she did and how she captured this. She had like the flag, uh, the signed uh, photos from like 50, 60 years back. She's 90 plus years old today. Catherine Wolfram, uh, the Berkeley professor, and uh, she got uh, hired as deputy assistant for climate and energy economics. She's an expert in emerging markets uh, energy consumption. And she knew Janet Yellen because both of them are Berkeley professors. And so 
when Janet Yellen got uh, elected by, by President Biden, she was she had raised her hand and they were both colleagues. So she said, hey, put your hand up for opportunity. That was a good learning from her. And she also said, uh, the first year in the government is very active, lots of things going on, lots of energy. And she shared some other insight, which is like there are very few people responsible even within the Fed or even within certain departments, like 10, 15 people who are actually making the decisions. And they might not actually know everything that's going on, even on the boundaries, because so much to do for them. And she shared around focus that the government has on electrification, infrastructure bill with the Build Back Better bill that's upcoming. The infra bill that was just passed, $1.5 trillion and early stage investments in new technology for energy. And the government's role of creating information and vis providing visibility on what are the risks with climate change so that the companies can actually make the right decisions. We then went on to J Labs, Johnson & Johnson's lab in the Innovation Lab Center in Washington, DC. And, and if you see, it's actually now it was uh, a military hospital that they took on, re-innovated. It's uh, highly connected with NIH because NIH is like a few blocks away. FDA is a few blocks away. Patent office is a few blocks away. The capital, you know, various partners in hospitals for the children's hospitals are all very close. So they're able to actually build a whole ecosystem with the JLabs innovation. So they actually in innovate and build and invest in startups to give them the space to actually innovate, use high-tech facilities. And they're building this ecosystem in a pretty big way. Um, and that was quite interesting to see how J Labs uh, is actually doing this. It's not related um, completely with understanding how the capital works, but they hosted us. So I understood a lot more about how the ecosystem is set up. So that was really good learning as to how to build that ecosystem and how to build and invest in those incubators that Johnson Johnson can now invest in because they have really good insights about what they're doing. And power of network was a key learning from speakers at JLabs, which is your network is already huge. So if you start knowing your network, investing in your network, and then if you expand that to the EMBA network, your executive MBA network, and then your LinkedIn network, you have a lot of power, you have a lot of reach. So that was a good learning from JLabs. Brian, he was the mayor's uh, assistant, I think, in Washington, DC. And uh, he was the one who was instrumental in getting Amazon to, to uh, consider Washington as one of the place. And they were very successful. And eventually he joined Amazon. He shared about uh, how they've added two new principles on the 14 leadership principles that Amazon has. The one that he talked most about was being the most Earth's best employer, Earth's best employer. It's one of the, one of the principles. I couldn't see it here in this photo, but they basically talked about leadership principles, how he got Amazon to actually consider them as the top 20 from all the, all the, people who express interest. He shared about the importance of daily pulse, which I felt was really interesting as to how at Amazon they daily, on a daily basis, they get a pulse about how they're feeling, how they how the manager's doing. And then they ask a specific set of questions, three questions repeatedly over time daily. And then the managers actually may held accountable for the results. And they are actually used, they're using that for uh, overall performance evaluation of the manager. So that was pretty interesting. Um, Sarah Bittleman, oh, she was the most, I would say open book. She shared life lessons. Someone asked her like, who is a successful politician? And she defined, and she asked the question back, like, hey, define what successful means. And that was the power of her presence. She actually like turned the table around and then the person who asked the question was, was thinking, well, what is success, right? So, so difficult questions can be put back to get clarification, which is a really interesting skill that I learned from her. And she shared some life lessons, which is show up when you have promised, 
for an event, for someone, show up, right? That's the biggest thing. And then do the work that you said you will do. Be pleasant to work with. I highlighted it primarily because a lot of people do work, but they're not pleasant. They don't do it fully with being fully there. So being pleasant and being good to work with and that someone want to come back and work with you is a good idea. Go deep to understand the implications, uh, the words that you use. Certain words can have triggers. So understand the implications uh, of what you're saying where you're saying it, how the other person sees it, and build an ability to transfer truth. Wow, that was interesting. It's just like, hey, be able to communicate what is possible, what's not possible. She's worked across various parts of the Capitol Hill. She's worked in the executive um, branch, and she's uh, had various um, tours of duty at the government. So really committed uh, um, member of the US Senate. Mike, he, he shared about how it is very difficult to pass something as huge as let's say the infra bill or the Build Back Better bill. He shared about like, hey, everything has to go through a legal committee. It has to be first drafted. Some of these bills are like 1800 pages long. Just to read it takes multiple days. And then they have to do a scoring, which is basically a dollar estimate for every aspect of the item in the bill. Once you do the scoring, you have to then have um, read it in front of everyone. And then you have to have the members in you know, the Senate updated so that when, when it goes from the House to the Senate, it actually is not like, hey, surprise. So there's a lot of that bookkeeping that needs to happen, but also that influence building that needs to happen. And then lots of court committee members have to be coordinated because it's not just one thing that's being passed. It's like 50 different committees trying to put everything into this Build Back Better bill or something like that. And then there's this bird rule, which he, which was really interesting that he talked about, which is how do you get away with the filibuster, right? Which is constant debate that happens uh, and it's encouraged. And that was really good. But even there, there's like certain things that he shared around how the reconciliation process, which was initially used just for reducing the deficit, but now it's also used to increase the deficit. So that was interesting. Uh, Michelle from the Small Business Administration shared really good tips uh, around how you can use so much money and resources that the S Small Business Administration has because there's a bipartisan agreement that uh, the small business is important. They've gone from seven billion, several billion dollars in budget allocation to the top two in terms of budget allocation. So there's lots of money available is what I learned from SBA to hire staff to let's say if you're a small business to develop your website, to hire marketing consultants, to go to trade shows. So there's lots of resource and support available in the small business administration, which was Really interesting to find out. Clarine uh, Riddle. So she is doing something really innovative. She's trying to bring Democrats and Republicans together. She's built this caucus called True Label, or not True Label, No Labels, nolabels.org. And she says, hey, if you want to be part of that caucus, you want, if you're a Republican, you have to bring a Democrat together. If you're a Democrat is trying to join you, you're going to bring a, a Republican together. So she's trying to bring people together in this small coalition or caucus, and uh, they're trying to move fast. If there's a 75%, if you're part of the caucus, and if there's 75% agreement, then everyone commits. So it's like disagree and commit. And if someone who's supposed to commit and you know vote for the bill and didn't vote, they are the caucus. So right now they're having identity crisis in that sense because it's drawn too big. And those people who said they would vote, they didn't vote. And so, but it's still innovative as to how do we get um, people who don't talk, talk first. And then how do we build consensus so that we move faster instead of constant debate. Major General, this guy had a lot of presence, a lot of presence. He was fully there. He talked about questions and answered them so very well even gave a memento to the professor at the very end for great works that she's doing with inviting them and uh, sharing experiences and educating the future leaders. 
someone asked him about what's the best leadership style that he would recommend and he said it's situational uh, there's a whole course i took on situational leadership so i quickly understood what he's talking about in terms of the biggest uh, threat for the us he said china 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 right so he <laughs> very clear and then he talked about going from work life balance which he thinks is a myth to work life integration and how you know as as a chief of staff for the us air force right he has a huge responsibility hundreds of billions of dollars of air force command and resources at his uh, influence and he says if you really want to influence someone understand their incentives and he says get to diverse perspectives quickly so that you can make better decisions and you can actually either change your mind or you will make better decisions right and from every question that someone asked him he would end with not just sharing his perspective but he would end with what do you think that is inclusive right you you're not only just sharing something about what what do you think but you're also asking the other person what do you think so the sense of belonging comes in a pretty big way by just watching the actions that these leaders do finally david is a director uh, for privacy and privacy council a lawyer right at tiktok he's also had a uh, similar privacy policy council at google so he shared about how the world's going towards more like splinter nets which is breaking down of the internet's by geo and how cross border data flow is going to be very important and how that federal government has a huge role to play in setting up privacy laws like the gdpr and that the european union did and digital sovereignty is super critical as everything is going digital so self regulation with big companies who already know what they're doing is is the first step forward but he also talked about section 230 which has been the big reason why a lot of tech digital companies have thrived and it being under attack as recently as uh, may 2021 where snapchat which introduced a speed filter it's actually going to be questioned and being made liable for a fatal car car accident so section 230 it's a big one we also did a lot of debate and we were all in different teams so universal child care us citizenship act immigration related women's health protection act endless uh, frontier act for innovation america's college promise act and i actually went in depth about the college promise act and i learned about i was debating for the pro to actually pass this which actually this act of america's college promise act actually gives um several things to high school graduates it gives free two years associate degree community college education it also incentivizes uh, these community colleges to improve better outcomes so that these these graduates actually have a path towards a four year college or have vocational training and it also establishes a billion dollars on top of all of this free tuition for student success funds to improve teachers improve the learning capabilities it's a huge act forward so i actually for the very first time read the bill and also read different perspectives and then built my own opinion about whether we should pass this or not so just doing these debates and listening to other team members doing debates on different topics really opened my eyes it's the first time that i actually read a bill so lots of learnings the biggest one is as executives and as future leaders it's very hard to ignore the federal government you cannot thrive if you're not an engaged leader and understand how politics works how government works and how you influence them so listening to these speakers really opened my eyes i understood so much about how these different branches of the government work actually visited each of these buildings we were given lectures uh, and q and a's in each of these buildings so there was such a in person experience there's executive branch there's the senate there's the house there's private sector there's lobbyists so much going on right and so the biggest learning also the professor shared with us is asking questions in a respectful way just to understand not to educate them 
or even give your point of view, but just asking them questions in a very respectful way is, is important. And the biggest thing, in the one biggest thing I learned that I came came out of this trip was I came out with a lot of empathy for these federal officials who are working for the government, working for the country. They're just going to be there for two years for most of them, but they're working really hard. I started an evening, um, you know, monuments tour at seven in the evening, and I saw that the House of Representatives were still working. So there was a flag that's on in the Capitol on these two sides, there's a House side and the Senate side. And the House side, if there's a flag and there's a light on the Capitol, that means that the House is still in motion. So at seven in the evening, I was like, they, they were still working. And my tour finished midnight and they were still working. And I found out the next day that they were working till two in the morning. So they're back in office at 10, they're working crazy hours just for the mission, just for the country. So I came up with a lot of empathy for the work that they do. And I also learned that they're really hard workers, but also intelligent. Most of these people that I talked with, I had a very different opinion about them than what I read about them or heard about, you know, saw their videos online. I had a very different perspective before, before going there. And finally, the museums that I, uh, one museum that I, I visited, there were like six, and I could only visit uh, one of them, the African-American uh, History Museum. This is the first time I actually visited a museum in my life, actually. I never wanted to go to the museum, but this was, this was, this opened my eyes. There were five floors, if I remember correctly, four or five floors, and I was only able to finish the ground floor in three hours. I'm gonna go back to DC to actually go and uh, see these museums just for that. Right? There's so much to learn from these museums. Sharing some photos of some uh, things that, some sites that I visited that I took. This was huge, the Lincoln Memorial. And spent a lot of time, this is the moonlight tour that I did in the evening. I also did a debate. So a lot of really fun, uh, fun debating and uh, I, the first time in a long time to doing professional uh, clothes. So I prepared them, enjoyed it thoroughly and see me up on stage debating uh, America's uh, College Promise Act. So a lot of fun, a lot of learning and um, gonna go back to DC. So thank you, Professor Mora and Hannah and the entire group and my debate group such amazing learning and uh thank you thank you all for watching this hope you felt inspired uh by some of these things thanks